Yeah, hi everybody. Thank you very much for joining me today with uh, this Q&A. We're looking at lesson four and uh, we're gonna be taking a peek at uh, your zone map as well as microclimate. So we can get right into that. Um, what we're gonna do is just review uh, which is what we usually do. We'll review the assignment and then take a look at um, some examples as well as some questions that have been posted. Um, and of course, if anybody has any questions during the call, just throw them in the chat here and we'll uh, do our best to answer them. Okay. So we are looking at lesson four here. And um, there's two sort of equally important parts to that. One is the microclimate assessment, and the other is the current zone map. So, and again, we're getting into more depth with our site analysis, and that I would say is one of the one of the many differences between uh, permaculture design and traditional land design is just the amount of uh, site analysis that uh, gets done prior to any um, design ideas coming out. Uh, in fact, during the, I've found that during the site analysis, that is when a lot of ideas start to percolate up. Um, but today we're gonna just take a look at a couple of those and that's again, microclimate and zones. So with the microclimate mapping, we're going to have uh, your base plan as part of this. <clears throat> and we want you to choose five existing plants that are there. And hopefully uh, with most sites, there'll be at least one tree and one shrub, but um, in the rare occasion there isn't. Uh, just put whatever you can in terms of what plants are available on your project site, um, the odd uh, student's gonna have a, <clears throat> and I have this in the, uh, another class that's running right now, that's um, six months ahead of this one, or not six months, six weeks, no, five weeks. Um, oh gosh, no, 10 weeks, there we go, finally got it. Um, this person's project site, is you know completely denuded of all vegetation it was a, a new site in a subdivision so just built a house on it so hence there's nothing there um so if you're in that sort of situation you still want to see, take a look at what is existing and uh, even if there isn't any trees or shrubs uh, there will definitely be some vegetation so we want to hear about that uh, so that's just one part of the uh, microclimate assessment. The other is actually mapping out on your project site the different microclimates that are there. And uh, those could be open and sunny, shaded and uh, moist understory. They could be windy, exposed, could be sheltered. It really does uh, depend a lot on the individual project site. If it's an urban site, um, it's going to be a little bit different than, say, a, a larger acreage. Um, but you're still going to have uh, a number of different microclimates on, regardless of your project site. Even if it was 10 acres and not a tree in sight, you're still going to have uh, some microclimates in particular around any existing structures. So that is um, something to, to keep in mind. Um, again, we want five different plants and they're a little write up on each one here, part of your um, template file. So that's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and some of the different elements that uh, we're asking for. So we want to see a microclimate on every part of your base plan. So it should have something uh, with a, a narrative, a little bit of an explanation. Um, 
easiest way to do the mapping is to have a legend or a key. And you want to also uh, indicate those five plants and some sort of microclimate plant identification chart filled out and attributes chart as well, as long as as well as the SWOT analysis. So that covers off the microclimates. Uh, so let's take a look at an example here. So these got a few examples from previous students. And this is a, a small urban, uh, actually it's a duplex here, so it's even smaller than it appears. Uh, hence half of this project site being um, sort of, uh, well, I won't say grayed out, but no color added. So this student here, uh, these were all of the microclimates that they assigned to them. So as you can see in an urban area, there, you know, there are potentially quite a few uh, microclimates and that could be shade from fencing or from a building. Um, there's often narrow shaded spaces, um, particularly on the side of a house, depending on the, the size of the project site. Uh, and then there's normally an open hot area. So there's a number that have been identified here and this student identified seven plants, even though you only have to do uh, five. And then the plant identification went over a couple of pages here. And this is really interesting. And this sort of plays into the big picture as well, because if you do have, um, particularly when you get a call for uh, some design work and you're going into a project, it's you know, you don't you don't often get asked to do design work on a project that's uh, looking good and in perfect condition. There's something not quite right, and that's you know why your clients or potential clients want you to fix. Uh, and just noting what plants are existing can often point you in an interesting direction. Um, especially if the site has been disturbed recently and just observing what um, what is coming behind them, right? So it could uh, point to, you know, compaction. Uh, it could point to many things. So the soil conditions, the, uh, the amount of water in the area, a lot of these things. I know we were recently at a project uh, site that we're, we're starting on um, and there's a, a huge amount of disturbance that was done and which is a bit disturbing <laughs> no pun intended but um, uh, these folks had cleared off part of a wetland and um, in hopes to to change it and uh, to make it drier and in fact they did the opposite because they've removed all the vegetation, but just walking around uh, on the site and there was literally carpets of uh, red alder coming up. And uh, that, that says a lot. It just tells you, you know, even under all of this uh, incredible disturbance, the trees, those particular pioneer trees want to come back and um, address the, the nature of the area, which is a lot of water. So, again, it's very interesting to uh, to really dial into what's already existing. It can really help. Uh, here's the microclimate attributes. So this is pretty, you know, pretty uh, deep, what the, we're asking for here. And it's a good exercise to go through. It really does help. Um, really help everyone try and dial into what these individual microclimates have in terms of their attributes. And then that makes it a, a lot easier when we get to the design uh, end of things, you know, what is appropriate in these different places.
And then we have a SWOT analysis. So that is um, one example. Uh, this is a larger property. Can't remember. Well, it's a little 15,000 square feet. Yeah, so it's a little over a quarter acre. Um, here are five different plants, but this is one thing to keep in mind. If there are a lot of Douglas fir, we just need to identify one in this exercise. We don't have to identify all of them, okay? Uh, and the same with bracken. <laughs> um, if you have bracken, and uh, that's interesting where I live, we did uh, quite a bit of renovation work. We've been here 27 years and we've had multiple concepts on our landscape. It's, it's uh, one of the horrors of uh, uh, designing your own space is it's continually changing. So we're in our sixth rendition and um, uh, we did a lot of disturbance uh, with the machine in here. And um, we are seeing an incredible amount of bracken in certain spots. So it's very interesting to see that popping up. And that's a really interesting uh, pioneer plant. So just a little side note on that. Um, again, the plant ID associated with those microclimates and the attributes for each one. So you can see with this, uh, this student, they didn't have as many as the urban uh, example we looked at, and um, and that could be. Um, I haven't done all the microclimates where I live, but we have a lot of open, hot areas, and definitely a lot of uh, wooded areas that are shaded, uh, and some in between. But um, you know, you could definitely expand on this a lot if you were so inclined. So uh, having five different microclimates on this sort of size property, I think is completely reasonable. And um, again, it's just gonna help as we go forward when we get into placing design elements. Um, it's a great thing to reference. And then we have another example here. This is five acres. <clears throat> and this can be quite typical where uh, most of the property is open and hot, uh, and, and in this case, windy. And then they have um, some other microclimates where they got um, really a partial shade where they get morning, uh, morning sun and shaded in the afternoon, um, cooler uh, morning sun, and then cool, moist, full shade. And then, and there are different types of shade, that's for sure. We have, uh, you can have very dry shade, um, which I'm sure uh, Philippe knows all about up in Kamloops. I'm sure there's a lot of dry shade up there. And uh, you can have shade that uh, is quite uh, damp, depending on what's going on in the project site. Um, so these are all really valuable uh, little aspects to note. And then, of course, we've got our plant ID here. And then, again, the attributes and the SWOT analysis. So those are a few examples. Um, and so that's the first part of the microclimate assessment and that's worth 10 points. And again, I would recommend, uh, everybody just take a look at the rubric as they're putting together their assignment, uh, just to make sure you're covering off all of the items that are asked for. And, uh, this is of course what I use to grade. So, um, take that uh, into consideration, which makes it super easy for me. Um, 
and as well, hopefully for, for yourself, knowing what to include. So with the zone mapping, now that's a little bit different and we are looking at current zones. So in a project site, if this is your project site, um, could be fairly easy to figure that out. If it's somebody, if it's a, a client's project site, that might take a little bit more effort uh, with some interviewing with them. But it is a really good, um, it's important uh, to note how the site's being utilized. So often in an urban area, um, we're looking at trying to better utilize some of the property. And I would say it's, that could be the case with acreage, but often with acreage, uh, you get so spread out and, um, you know, that's just the reality. A larger space is harder to manage. So you really want to try and pull all of those daily important tasks uh, closer into the, um, closer to your habitat, right? So I have one project uh, that we were involved with and the clients had an existing chicken coop and that was great. They had chickens, they looked pretty happy. Um, They're on three acres and for whatever reason, their chicken coop was at the far end of the property. So that's just not a, an ideal if you're designing to have some, uh, particularly chickens that you have to visit. Um, you know, for us, we visit ours three times a day and it's there right at the edge of zone one. Uh, they're between zone one and two where we are. In fact, I can just turn and look out and, and see them out there. Um, which isn't a bad thing where I live because we have quite a bit of predator pressure. So the zones are really a critical part. And I'd say there it's, you know, one of the best things that permaculture uh, can bring into, um, you know, our design sense is just utilizing zones. And just especially when you get onto larger properties, it just makes so much sense to have those things that you use most often uh, closer to your house. It's, it's kind of like a clothesline. It wouldn't make much sense to have your clothesline 300 feet from your prop or from your house. Um, and a lot of that <clears throat> um, can be said for your vegetable gardens, um, you know, that sort of thing. So we have, where I live, we have a kind of our kitchen garden right outside of the kitchen on the south side of our house, kind of idyllic that way. Um, and that's for um, sort of everyday salads and stuff and, and some heat lovers go in there. And then when we get further away from the house, we get into more of our cropping beds, like with our potatoes and kohlrabi and other uh, veggies that don't need uh, sort of daily cordling. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I look at some <laughs> sites where they, the people have a, a huge vegetable garden all in one area, and I'd love that. Ours is spread out a little bit just due to the nature of our property. Uh, ours is fairly, well, we got a, a little bit of slope, and it's flat um, near the top of it. So that's where we're trying to condense a lot of our growing where it's easier and flatter, but um, uh, let's see here. So hence, yes, the zones being a very important um, approach to the design, how you're, how you're traveling through the site and um, appropriately selecting elements that are gonna fall into that. Now, what you'll probably find is when we get to the end of the course, and your project site has been fully designed, that those that zone map might change a little bit. Okay, uh, so we have some resources here. Not a lot, 
there are some more sample reports that you can look at. So that's great. Okay, so that is basically what's up. Oh, I haven't been keeping my eye on the chat, sorry. I see we got a message here from Philippe. Uh, in Hort School, they talked about placing pieces of interest. That one really nice flowering plant, little bench to pull you outside of the usual routine movements. Do you include these things in your designs? <clears throat> um, I, I would say that um, when we're looking at um, things conceptually, we definitely approach them. Oops. Um, it's a good question. Just trying to figure out how to, I know where you're going with this. And, um, I really think it's site specific. So we, we have, and when I say that it's more, there are some sites that are wide open. And you want to create a, a purpose and a reason for traveling through them instead of just, um, you know, going out the door of the house and looking and you can see everything and there's no need to, to, to uh, venture. So I think that's where you're going a little bit is just pulling people into areas. So almost like making little rooms or, you know, I don't want to... Um, but yes, I do think that there there's an obvious hub for, let's say, outdoor living. And part of that might include what you've described here. Um, there may be instances where you get pulled into, well, you get tricked into going down a, a pathway just to see what is at the end of it. Um, so yeah, it, that is very much a, a site specific item. And I would say that we probably were more conscious of that earlier in our career. Um, I think a lot of things that happen with our design work now are just unconscious, uh, including the zones. Like we do not do zone maps for our, our clients and, um, we just, inherently kind of know uh, what's going on that way. So, and I, I guess there's a lot of inclusive activities with our clients. So we go through each layer with them uh, as we go through the design. So it's not, um, yeah, that's, it's a step that uh, we don't actually go through. We don't do microclimate assessment either, although we are. So we kind of, we're just doing it in the back of our mind. We know where all these uh, uh, shady or really hot appropriate spots are. Um, if we are, let's say we're on an acreage site and um, uh, we're looking at putting, let's say, a greenhouse or... Um, yeah, greenhouse is a biggie, or even a vegetable garden. Like we did this in in last summer, we were trying to locate the best location on our property for um, squash mound, uh, winter squash mound. And uh, we've grown squash every year. They we tend to move uh, that growing area around a little bit. Um, again, the curse of changing our mind about our landscape now and then, but this is a great app here, Sunseeker. So this kind of falls into the microclimate um, genre in that um, if you've never used it, it's a really useful tool. It gives you this 
sort of uh, augmented reality. So you can click into this 3D mode and, and put your phone up and it'll show you the path of the sun uh, on that day, on today. Uh, it also shows you, in this case, it's showing the winter sun path, and then uh, this looks like the spring uh, solstice here. So it's a very useful tool for locating um, elements in the landscape where light is precious. So again, that drops into our microclimate. Yeah, uh, Philippe, I don't know if I answered your question properly. Um, I think uh, that there are so many approaches and um, there's, I think with uh, myself and my wife, we started out in the, the traditional landscape um, industry and uh, found permaculture later on in our career and, you know, heavily shifted over to that. So there's these sort of blurred lines and um, it's hard to know where one starts and one ends, but um, it's always been important to us to have um, that aesthetic element and interest and really um, usable usability uh, with the space. So pulling one outside of their usual routine. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I, we do that so much anymore. Um, and I think that you could uh, do that on certain sites, perhaps your site that you're working on, a, a, an urban area. Uh, it may be a little trickier on the on the larger sites. Then you'd kind of have to ask yourself why you're doing that. But <laughs> having some mystery is a great idea. Um, but also having some purpose behind that is, is something to keep in mind. Yeah, let's see here. So let's take a look at some of the zone examples. So on an urban site, you often are just going to have, you know, it may even be just two zones, right? It really does depend. In this case, there's three, zone one, two, and three. Uh, I'll, I'd also kind of put out there that zone five is, you know, rarely, if ever, seen in an urban environment because zone five is basically an untouched uh, wilderness area. So that's something that uh, I do see get placed into um, some students' designs in urban locations. And I think it's just a, um, a case where maybe they feel they're, they should be putting all the zones in, uh, but that's not the case at all. Uh, the smaller the site, the smaller it's going to, you know, the less zones are going to be typically. So on a larger site, uh, having a, all those zones is, you know, is what one would expect. And if you get, have a zone five uh, there, you know, that's great. But again, it's usually a wilderness area. So an area that's untouched. So where I live, it, it would be, uh, you know, and we have quite a bit of Douglas fir and, um, you know, mixed forest uh, that we don't do any maintenance in at all. So that would be a zone five. And again, it's, it's these larger sites where you're going to see that. And this is another good example. This, uh, this is a five acre site and there's no zone five. And why is that? Well, this is one of those instances where they had uh, pretty much a cleared site. So five acres that was uh, just basically pasture. So pasture is not zone five. And um, you know that, that's how this was depicted. 
So zone one, you can see is pretty large. And funny enough, that remained unchanged uh, at the end of the course for this student. I, I would say this is a little bit large for your zone one on a larger property. You know, on agricultural um, properties, we see zone one get spread out quite a bit. Uh, but in, in a homestead, it's nice if it can be a little bit tighter. I think those are all the examples. Anybody have any questions about um, their expectations on their zone or microclimate? Okay, so there was, a, uh, Philippe uh, sent a good question um, earlier in the week, and I thought it'd be a great opportunity to answer during the class here, or during the Q&A, sorry. Um, so there's three, I added one, okay. Uh, the first one is just about small scale grain production. <clears throat> which is a really good idea. And I did find a bit of info on that. Um, so this person wants to get as many calories as possible off the property. Grains and nuts. So long-term hazelnuts. Yeah, that's a great idea. And grains are quick, and they are. Yeah, and there was, I'm not sure you recall or have seen, but this was a bit of a, a trend in uh, Vancouver in, uh, for boulevards. Um, not extensively, but there were certainly some people that were getting rid of their lawn and, and turning them into uh, micro um, grain production. So... I looked up some info and I'm just trying to recall the quantities. I think they were saying there was about, I think it was 30 square feet. I'll take a look. I think it was, you get six cups of flour from 30 square feet. Of course, this is going to be really uh, variable. <clears throat> yeah, so we've done a little bit of this um, just out of ac by accident with our chickens. So there's been areas where we move our chickens around and um, we've had grain follow them. Um, 25 pounds off 450 square feet. Wow, that's quite substantial. That was, they did well. Yeah, that's very nice. Gosh, I'd say that would be... Hmm, that would be certainly uh, an enviable harvest. Um, I think it's worth trying for sure. Um, and not that hard to do. And certainly where you are in Kamloops, it should be pretty easy just timing it with the weather, right? Getting an early start with that. So yeah, that's that's a great idea. I think you mentioned potatoes here. Yeah, potatoes are a great idea. Maybe corn might be as well, but again, a little different. Um, I think grains would be easier. So hopefully that uh, helps you out with that. Um, is rainwater off an asphalt shingle roof a health risk? Well, it can be for sure. What um, traditionally what we do when we are dealing with urban landscapes is most of the roof uh, roofing materials are asphalt shingle or some variant of that. And um, they have a lot of hydrocarbons uh, 
as you can imagine, uh, as well as fire retardants. And it's, it's actually in the first five years of the roof's existence, a new roof up to five years. So they're really, um, there's a lot of, of runoff from the, that. Now, I, I, not runoff, it's just a lot of compounds coming out of the, sh the shingle during the first five years. So from that point on, there's less, but it's still going to be an issue for uh, food crops, annual vegetables. So I wouldn't be collecting off of asphalt shingle for annual vegetable use. You could send that into ornamental you could send that into a woody, um, like uh, any woody, an orchard, raspberries, blueberries. Uh, technically, that those compounds are going to get locked up in the wood, not the fruit. So, but generally speaking, I think the best use of uh, asphalt shingle uh, rainwater is into a rain garden. So then it can actually remediate those compounds uh, versus just sending it into storm, the storm sewer. And let's see, it's below the ground. Right. So already <laughs> where you are, uh, the water's just hitting the ground. It's getting remediated or running off onto somebody else's property. But a rain garden is a fabulous... Um, approach and if you're looking for this an, an incredible publication here uh, the address is up top here uh, this is or you can just search google uh, rain rain garden handbook for western washington this is a fabulous book the first one i ever installed i definitely leaned heavily on this for info and um it's just telling you the, some of the basic principles. Uh, when you're setting this up, you want to have, uh, you know, you have to plan it all out. You have to do, basically, don't have to, but often some excavation and then backfill, and then you're going to plan that ponding height, uh, and with that, your overflow. And uh, that's a really important part, is having uh, somewhere for that water to go, uh, we installed quite a large uh, rain garden. I don't know if I... I'll, I'll try and bring it up a little bit later if we got time. Um, certainly, I'll show it to you all in the next Q&A when we're looking at water. But uh, we put in a large uh, rain garden. Even though we have a metal roof, we put in a large rain garden because we wanted to send... Um, drainage from our parking area. Uh, we have a ditch that runs along our uh, the top of our property, uh, as well as one section of our roofing that we, we can elect to put it into the rain garden, and it'll hold about 3,000 gallons when it's at this stage when it's full. And it, it hit that a couple of times during the winter. Um, and then, boom, it goes into an overflow. But all of that water that gets infiltrated, it's just such a benefit for everything downstream. So for us, we're infiltrating that high in our landscape, and all we have an orchard below it, you know, a small orchard. Uh, and you can already see the benefit to that, and it's just recently been put in. But this is a great um, publication. And one thing that's really good about it is at the end here, uh, and I won't get into a rain garden construction right now, but there's three zones. There's the bottom, which is zone one, and the edge is zone two, and the top is zone three. And here we got a, a great plant list and what they are appropriate for, right? So really valuable um, <clears throat> chart here showing you where you can what what'll do well and where it can go. So check that out. Get back to our questions here. Yep. 
Yeah, so hopefully that uh, answered your question with that. Rain gardens are, are definitely something to consider. And third question was, do we have a week-long break? Yes, we do. So the way our schedule works is uh, lesson number five is due on June 12th. So that week, I'm uh, doing various things with OSU. So at the end of the week is the 17th, and then there's a break. And then we come back on the 26th. We're going to have our first Q&A. That'll be on lesson six. And uh, that's then lesson six is due on July 3rd. So there is a little over a week. Uh, if you were to submit on the Monday, you'd have basically two weeks there. So it's a nice break. And for those that are running a little behind, a uh, chance for them to get caught up. Yeah, so hopefully that has uh, helped you out there, Philippe. Um, let me just show you one thing here. This was just uh, an image of a landscape we did Gosh, I don't know. It's about 25 years ago. And this is a little commercial complex. And um, this relates to uh, the microclimate. So this is a south-facing wall that get, and there's no irrigation here, no water. Um, and it, <laughs> this long ago, you can see I already had a heavy leaning to, this is sea kale, uh, cranby. Maritima, which is a beautiful edible. Uh, just had some last night in our dinner. Um, it's it's uh, the florets before they open are like broccoli. It's uh, just a beautiful edible plant and very durable. Grows just about anywhere. It'll grow in gravel. Uh, doesn't need any special treatment at all but the point of the image here was just you know recognizing the microclimate here sets you up for what plants uh in this case what plants we were going to include so we had smoke bush and ceanothus and we had a cardoon here uh could have put an artichoke uh, but cardoon is more reliable where i live and a euphorbia and a pita and this is Flomus. This is one of my favorite herbaceous perennials right there. Tough to get. Um, however, that uh, that gives you a little bit of a, a shot um, at the importance of microclimate. So if you didn't recognize what was happening here and you were trying to assemble plants to go in there, your results might be mixed, right? So... That's just in regards to planting. So it, it's the same with, um, um, well, let's say with a seating area, right? Or trying to shade the house, like where we live, we have uh, our kitchen and then a south facing, our, our kitchen south facing, so very hot in the summer. And we want all that winter uh, light but we want it shaded during the summer months. So we have, uh, we've got a little bit of both. We have plants that provide shading during the winter, or sorry, during the summer. Um, and, and they're deciduous, so we get full, full on sun during all the winter months, which is wonderful. And uh, yeah. So anybody have any other questions or Anything they want to explore today? We've got another 10 minutes that we can can certainly dive into anything uh, related to this lesson or beyond. I will say that lesson five, <laughs> so our next Q&A, um, that's traditionally the hardest week or the hardest, uh, hardest assignment. So that's when... Um, 
that if you can't make the meeting for that, you definitely want to check out because we're looking at micro watersheds and that can be a little bit tricky. It can be tricky even on a small site. So it, it's certainly something that, um, uh, and actually since got you here, I'll just show you an example. It's a post uh, that we put on Instagram a couple of days ago. There we go. I'll just share that. So one of those programs we use uh, is um, QGIS. And um, it's an open source software. Uh, it's not very intuitive. It's I find it quite difficult to learn. But uh, luckily, I, I've at the moment, I'm taking some training through the Regrarian platform, uh, which is Darren Doherty's uh, farm scale uh, training program. And part of that is there's an offer for um, a QGIS um, module that I often reference. So <clears throat> we use that. And um, this is an example of one of, of some of the data that it's uh, produced for us. And here's our project site boundary in red. And this is a site I was talking about earlier that was disturbed. And right along here, where my cursor is, here, I'll get my, uh, right along here is a rail line. And this property slopes in this direction. So there is uh, quite, there's nowhere for the water to go. That's obvious. Even though you can see the water does keep flowing. Um, but th this map, uh, these colors represent different parts of water flow. So the purple is sort of the first stage, and then it goes to blue, and then a turquoise, and then green. So as these all come together and get more um, more substantial, they the colors change on these. And on and this particular map is showing us where. Um, <clears throat> basically our micro watershed. So what, when we get water that drops right here on a neighboring site, it potentially can end up on the project site. And this is, ex this is a, a really uh, interesting project that way that we, we really need to know uh, how much approximately how much water that this site gets inundated with every year in order to design it correctly. So we're, with this project, we're doing what's called a feasibility report where we're looking at whether we can actually design something to match up with our client's needs. We're not sure. Um, we've come up with a concept that I think will work, but it may not be something that they desire. They want this to be you know, a, a usable dry area, and it's just not um, fully going to happen. You know, there's going to be a wetland component there. And it, and this map tells you why, right? So I, we, I think we ran some, uh, we ran the numbers on that. Um, and I'm trying to remember... Just grab it here. There we are. So yeah, this site is receiving about five and a half million gallons of runoff per year. And that's based on just a 20% 
uh, runoff. So it may or may not be accurate, but, um, you know, even if it's 4 million, it's still a huge volume of water that's being sent and consolidating in this corner here. So again, this is all about uh, micro water sheds and uh, we won't be looking at this kind of map in lesson number five this is you know not something we're going to do but what we are going to do is take um, contours information from your project site and uh, from areas around it and we're going to use that to calculate where the micro watershed is. And we actually did that on this site before this map got generated and it was pretty much identical. So, all right, so that is that. Um, don't think I have anything else to share with you today. If there's uh, any questions, please feel free to shoot them out. And if not, we'll... Um, We'll wrap up our meeting here. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending today. And best of luck with your assignments. Um, look forward to seeing them next week. And then, um, then the following week, we'll get into that uh, lesson number five, the water, micro watershed. So yeah, everybody have a great, uh, great rest of your week. And um, thank you again. <laughs>